Well, hello everybody. This is Miss Manili, and I'm going to give you a brief tutorial to help you get to know the TI graphing calculator. And it doesn't matter if you have a TI-83 or a TI-84. Um, both calculator um, operating systems are virtually the same. The TI-84 has some statistical features that the 83 doesn't. But um, for what we're going to be doing in this tutorial, either calculator will work. Um, if you have a graphing calculator, um, you can obviously use it during the tutorial. If you don't have a graphing calculator at home, please check the link because you can actually download a free virtual TI uh, graphing calculator from Texas Instruments and from their website. Um, you, there are also um, graphing calculators that can be downloaded onto your smartphone. Fortunately, I don't think the iPhone um, has an app for the TI calculator, but I do think there is a TI um, app for the Android. Um, some of the apps are free, some of them um, are just a few dollars, but it can save you some money if you, if you don't want to purchase a $100 graphing calculator. We'll also have them available for rental from the school for $15 for the year. But to get through the uh, summer assignment, like I said, you can just download the, the graphing calculator from the TI website. In fact, that's the graphing calculator that I'm going to be using, and you can see it over here on the left of my screen. I downloaded the TI-83 plus Silver Edition, and so that is the calculator I'm going to be using throughout this tutorial. So getting to know the graphing calculator, if you've never used one, um, basically I'm going to show you how to um, perform some of the most common features that you'll be doing in math class, from graphing to looking at tables to um, finding solutions to equations, finding um, resetting the window, the table, things like that. Um, so just a couple of things. Any commands that you see in yellow, so if you look, and I know that this um, calculator is kind of small, but if you look above all the keys, you'll notice some words in yellow. And I know they're really hard to see um, from this perspective. Um, but all of those are secondary keys that you can get by hitting the second button first. And notice that your cursor will change to a little up arrow like that. That just lets you know that you're in the secondary mode. So for example, if I wanted to, um, it's kind of hard to see, if I wanted to go to my matrix menu, for example, that's above this x to the negative 1. And so that would bring me to my matrix menu. Um, and then I can go from there. Um, and then second quit just brings you back to your home screen. That's what this screen is called, your home screen. This is where you're going to be doing any of your basic operations. So if you want to do 6 times 9, um, you're going to do it right here on the home screen. Press enter. That's the same as an equal sign. Um, we're also going to be looking at some of the graphing features, and so we'll be entering equations in a y equals menu. This is where you're going to enter all your equations. Um, if I want to graph, I'll go to my graph window, and um, you'll see that we can actually reset the axes. If I go to my window, um, the x min and the x max give me the, um, the basic domain for my function, and then the y min and the y max give me the range for the function, and so I can expand it as large or small as I want. Um, there are also some automatic settings for your window. So, for example, if you go to Zoom, it'll actually, these are the automatic window settings that the calculator offers. And sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you just have to, to reset the window by hand. Um, you'll also notice that the trace feature, um, actually it's behind the trace, you'll notice above the um, trace button is something that says calc. Um, if you hit second calc, if you've got an equation entered in your in your y equals and you're graphing it, we can find the any value of x on the equation, the zero of the equation or the zero of the function is basically where it crosses the x-axis. We can find any minimum, maximum values. We can find intersections. So we're going to be using that menu a lot. Um, notice above the graph button is another um, yellow word that says table. So if I have an equation, which I don't think I do, but if I had an equation in here, Oops, let me go back. Um, this button right here is your variable button. So if I wanted to type in, for example, 6x plus 1, I would just hit this variable button. And then I can do plus 1. And I'll just go ahead and graph for what I have now. But if I also wanted to look at a table of values, if I hit second and then graph, that's going to bring me to my table menu. And the calculator has some settings that are automatically set up so you can view um, the table of that of that function. So we'll be able to look at multiple representations of each function. Um, any any um, 
and it's hard to see on this calculator, but any uh, symbols on your calculator that are written in green or are, is, is going to be something that you would access through the alpha keys. So it's really hard to see, but above the math button is actually the letter A. So if I hit alpha, well, actually I'm not going to be able to do it on the screen. If I hit, go back to my home screen, for example, if I hit the alpha button, notice that my cursor turns into a little A. That lets me know I'm in alpha mode. So if I wanted to type in an A, I could. And sometimes we'll use the alpha buttons if we want to store values and recall them later. Um, we do this in a lot of um, the upper math classes, like statistics, pre-calculus, so that we don't lose our place values with rounding. All right, so let's get started. Um, I just want to first talk about performing basic operations, like adding, subtracting, um, raising to a power, dealing with fractions. There are some things that you have to recognize with the graphing calculator. The graphing calculator is going to perform whatever operation you tell it to, um, and it's going to follow the order of operations. So sometimes what we have written on our paper, um, and if we type it in exactly the way it appears into the calculator, the calculator will go in, in a different order than we recognize it should. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, one of the things that you want to get to know is this little, it's called a caret. It looks like an up arrow, and it's right above your division symbol. Anytime you want to raise a number to a power, you're going to use this, this, um, this button. And it's called a caret. So the caret command allows you to enter exponents other than two. There is another place that you can enter exponents, and that's the x squared button. And that all that'll do is square whatever number you put in there. Um, the one above it, x raised to the negative one, is the inverse button. So for example, um, if I wanted to raise, if I wanted to do two inverse, for example, two to the negative one power. Um, a negative exponent essentially takes the inverse of the reciprocal of the number. And so 2 to the negative 1 is equivalent to 1 half. Um, if I wanted to do 2 squared, that's going to give me 4. Um, if I wanted to do 2 to the third, though, I would have to use my up arrow, or that caret button, 2 to the third. And that'll give me 8, because 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So you're given an expression on your calculator, or I'm sorry, you're given an expression on the worksheet that says 3 times the quantity 2 thirds raised to the 4 minus 1. And so this is an example of what we have on, the, on our paper, um, how we sometimes have to make adjustments when we enter it into our calculator. If we follow the order of operations, if you think about PEMDAS, um, the first thing we'd want to evaluate is the 2 thirds. So, I mean, 2 thirds is basically 0.66666. Um, the next thing I'd want to look at is my exponent, 4 minus 1. And if I evaluate that, I know that that's going to give me 3. And so I'm basically looking at 2 thirds raised to the third power. That's essentially raising 2 to the third power and dividing that by 3 raised to the third power. And then finally, my last step would be to multiply by 3. Well, there's two ways that you could enter this into the calculator. Um, and if you look at letter B, and, and notice that either way that you enter it, you're going to get a different answer. And the second option, there are no parentheses around the 4 minus 1. What this is actually telling the calculator to do is to raise 2 thirds to the fourth power then multiply by 3, and then finally subtract 1, and that's not what we want it to do. We want it to subtract the 1 from the 4 in the exponent. And so when we enter our command, we need to make sure that we put parentheses, and your parentheses keys are right above the 8 and 9. We need to put our exponent in parentheses. So it's common practice anytime you're dealing with fractions, negative numbers, and exponents, that you get in the habit of putting parentheses around them, even though you may not see parentheses written on your paper. So here are four examples, um, and I'd like you to go ahead and, and uh, pause the video um, and try entering these into your calculator and see uh, what, and, and write down the answer that you get, and then we'll check them on the next page. Um, but go ahead and press pause. Okay. If you've done it correctly, um, for example, in number one, we have one divided by three plus one. If you simply enter 1 divided by 3 plus 1, the way it appears on your paper, you're going to get, oops, you're going to get a different answer than uh, what I did on the, on the answer key, okay? The, the correct answer is 0.25, and we know if, I'm, if we're looking at this problem that 3 plus 1 is 4, and 1 divided by 4 is 1 fourth or 0.25. But notice that if you don't put parentheses around the 3 plus 1, the calculator is dividing 1 by 3 and getting 0.33333 and then adding 1. So you do have to recognize that sometimes, especially when we're dealing with fractions, when we're dealing with negative numbers, and when we're dealing with exponents, sometimes it's necessary to put parentheses in your calculator even though they don't appear on your, on your paper. Um, two and three are really, really common errors. It's kind of obvious the way I've got it written here. 
um, if you've got negative 2 squared, um, like we do in number 2, this is basically saying take the opposite of 2 squared. Um, whereas in number 3, it's saying square the number negative 2. And you'll get a different answer. Because in number 2, if I take the opposite of 2 squared, well, 2 squared is 4, and the opposite of that is negative 4. But in number 3, I'm squaring negative 2, which is the same thing as saying negative 2 times negative 2. And when I multiply two negatives, I always get a positive. So this is a really common thing. Um, the way it's written here is pretty easy. But for example, if I had something like um, x, and I asked you to raise it to the second power, and then I said, evaluate when x is negative 2, um, this is when students tend to make mistakes because they type it in as it's written in number 2 here instead of putting the, ne putting the negative 2 in parentheses before squaring it, which is really what this quantity is asking you to do. It's the quantity x squared. And that's different from if I did this. So these two expressions are different. The first one is saying square whatever number I put in for x. So if I'm putting in a negative 2, I need to put parentheses around it. The second one is saying take the opposite of x squared. So no matter what I put in for x, it's going to end up coming out negative because when I square something, it's always positive. Taking the opposite makes it negative. So these are two really, really common errors that we see with students as they enter um, negative numbers in the calculator. The last one in number four is just a reminder anytime you're dealing with fractions, you do want to make sure the numerators and denominators are in parentheses. The numerator in this case is just one term, so it's not necessary. But if I was doing three squared plus one over three plus three times two, I'd want to make sure that I put both quantities in parentheses. Okay, so let's get started with the graphing features of your calculator. All right, so um, I've given you an equation, y equals 3x squared plus 2x plus 16. Let's go into our y equals menu. I'm going to clear out what's there, and I'm going to go ahead and type in 3. Make sure you're using the variable x and not the alpha x. I'm going to use my caret button for the x squared. Uh, plus 2x plus 16. And my advice whenever you're graphing is to always start with a standard window. And the standard window can easily be obtained by going to your Zoom menu and scrolling down to option 6. And you can either use the down arrow or just type in 6, and it'll bring you to a standard window. The standard window is always going to give you, about, give you a window that goes from negative 10 to positive 10 on both the x and the y axis. However, if I look at my graph, I don't see a function here. I don't see anything, which means that I'm going to have to adjust my window settings to make it work. So it's helpful if you understand some characteristics about the equation. So for example, if I have this equation. This is a quadratic equation. One of the things I know about a quadratic equation when it's in standard form is that the constant, in this case 16, is your y-intercept. So if my y-intercept is at 16, then I need to make sure that my y-axis goes that high. I also know from this equation that my graph is going to be a parabola that opens up. So all of my y values are going to be larger than 16. So if I want to adjust my window settings, I'm actually going to hit the window button, and I'm going to make some changes. I'm really not sure what to do about the x yet, but I do know that I need to make some changes for y. For example, my maximum y value is only 10, and I need it to be at least 16. In fact, I need my minimum to be at least 16. So I'm going to actually adjust my, um, my y min, and I'm going to make my y min positive 10. And I'm going to make my y max, since I know that all of my y values are going to be greater than 16, I'm going to go ahead and start with making it 50. So all my y values are going to be between 10 and 50. My x values are between negative 10 and positive 10. Um, a lot of times when you're adjusting the window settings, it's a trial and error process. And sometimes students get really frustrated when they don't see, the, when they don't see their graph right away. So don't give up. It's really easy just to go back to your window screen, change the window settings, and then hit graph again. And notice that when I did that, I can see this parabola, and I can see its primary features. For example, I can see the vertex, and I can see that it continues to increase um, on both sides of the x, or both sides of the y-axis, for example. So this gives me a really good indication of what this function looks like. Um, if I wanted to, I could also adjust my um, x settings or my x. So, like, if I went from negative five, whoops, if I went from negative five to positive five, for example. 
I can see a little bit, I'm zoomed in just a little bit more um, with my x values. And so again, I can see that function very clearly. Okay. I also want to explore the table features, because very often you're asked to um, produce values of y for given values of x. And there's ways to do this very quickly on your calculator. So for example, if I hit the second button, and then graph. And notice that when I do that, the table option, my table menu is right above it. And so here is my table. And notice that it's set so that all of my x's are increasing by 1. And then it's automatically telling me the corresponding y value. And that's great. Sometimes you're asked to actually fill out a table or complete a table of values. And so um, if you take a look um, at some of the settings, for example, if I wanted to start at negative 10 on my table and count by twos, I can actually adjust my window settings or my uh, table settings. So um, you have your window button, which is where you adjust your window settings. Above that is your table set. So if you hit the second button and then table, um, you can actually adjust your table settings, just like we did with our window. So the first option is to say where you want the table to start. Well, if I look at step two, my table is starting when x is negative 10. So I'm going to type in negative 10. And then I want to see um, this little um, triangle here represents the Greek letter delta, delta table. And delta, if you remember from algebra 1, um, means change. So we use the delta symbol when we were dealing with slope. Delta y over delta x, the change in y over change in x. Well, this is just saying, well, how do you want the table values to change? And if I look at the table on my paper, I know that they're increasing by 2. So if I go down to this line, and you can use enter or um, the down arrow, I'm going to enter in a 2. If I want the calculator to automatically produce the y values, then I'm going to set everything to auto. And then I'm going to go back to my window settings. And I can see that they produce everything I need. Sometimes, though, you only want specific values of x. Maybe not in any kind of pattern. Maybe you want to evaluate the function at 6 or 8 or at negative 3,000. And scrolling through your table is going to be nuisance. I, don't, I certainly don't want to just keep pressing my down arrow until I get to negative 3,000 or positive 5,000. So if we go back to our table set, so second window, what I could do then is change my independent variable to ask. Now, unfortunately, it gives you the option to change the dependent variable to ask, but you can't really do that. It doesn't go the other way. You can only enter in values of x, and then it'll produce the value of y. It won't actually solve an equation. So if I type in values of y, it won't automatically give me the value of x. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why that's even an option on here. But if I set the independent variable to ask, notice when you go into your table, there's nothing there now. The great thing is, though, I can type in any number I want, and it'll produce the y value. So if I want to figure out what happens when x is negative 5,000, let me see what I did here. OK, so I accidentally used the um, keystrokes on my computer. So instead of typing in a negative, I think I typed in a minus sign and my calculator gave me an error message. So there's two options that it'll give you, and this is good. Um, you can quit and start over again, or you can actually go to the go-to and figure out what you did wrong. And I realize, if you see where the cursor is blinking, I accidentally typed in, an, in a minus symbol instead of a negative. And on your calculator, there are two different buttons. Your minus is below the times button. The negative is below the three. And so you'll see if I change it, it actually raises it and makes it a little bit smaller to indicate that it is a negative. Okay, so I can type in any numbers I want if I set it to ask. So it just sort of depends on the scenario. But that's how you use the table feature in your calculator. Okay, so I have a couple of examples um, that are, are going to give you a little bit of practice going through graphing, changing your window settings, evaluating the function for different values of x. It's also going to show you some common errors that you might get on the calculator or some, some weird things that the calculator displays that you have to be able to understand. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video. I'd like you to go ahead and graph the equation um, that is given um, using the standard window settings. Okay, So this is just your, your Zoom standard menu, Zoom 6. And then um, this is just a little bit more practice filling in the table of values. And you'll have to reset your table and then figuring out the answers to each of those 
uh, questions. And in letter C, you're going to see something happen that we're going to have to be able to explain. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and pause the video and try these on your own. And then when you're done, come back and I'll go through them with you. Okay. So the first thing you should do is go ahead and type in your equation. So it's going to be 3 times 2. Um, be careful when we raise it to the x minus 1 power. I need to make sure that I put that in parentheses. It says to go ahead and do this on a zoom standard window. So I'm going to hit zoom 6. And that's what your graph should look like. If I want to go ahead and produce this table of values, I'm going to go back to my table set menu, second window. And because I have to fill in a bunch of numbers, and because they're all in an order, um, it's going to be easier for me to set this back to auto. So notice that the first x value I have is negative 2. And it looks like we're climbing by 4. So my change in table is going to be 4. And I want to set everything to auto. When I do that, I'm going to go back to my table. And these are the values you should see. Now notice, when x is 22, you'll see this uh, number on your table that looks like 6.29E6. Well, what does that number mean? Well, if you actually move your cursor down to that value, um, you'll see the exact y value is, uh, looks like 6,291,456. Um, what happens on the table menu is that your columns are a fixed width, and so they only fit so many characters. So if you have a number that's over a million, um, it's not going to be able to fit all the digits in that, in that list. So what it does is it uses scientific notation. And scientific notation, um, you may know this from, from science, so what you see on your calculator as 6.29E6 is actually the same as 6.29 times 10 to the 6th power. And that's scientific notation. And a lot of times we use scientific notation when our numbers are either really, really, really big or really, 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 really small. So for example, if I had a number that was like 0 .00000001, you're going to see the 1 and then an E and a negative number following that, telling you to move the cursor back the other way. So whenever that, the number after E is positive, you know that your answer is very large. Whenever that number is negative, you know your number is very small. It's going to end up being less than 1. Okay. Um, and so hopefully that answers the question. So if ever you see an E, that's just an indication that you're dealing in scientific notation. Okay. The next example is this is considered a rational function. And those of you that are taking Algebra 2 and Precalculus will become fam familiar with these functions. A rational function is a fraction that involves x in the denominator. I do need to remember when I'm typing this in, though, that x plus 3 is all part of the denominator. And then to ensure that the calculator knows that, I need to put parentheses around it. Now here you're given the window settings. You're told that x is between negative 8 and positive 4. This is written as a compound inequality. But it's the same as saying that the lowest value that x can take on is negative 8. And the largest value that x can take on is a positive 4. And the equal sign that's associated with those inequalities basically says that x can actually equal negative 8 and it can equal 4. If I just wanted x to be between negative 8 and positive 4 and not include those endpoints, then I would just use basic less than symbols. So to set up my window, I'm going to go into my window settings. And then again, my x min, that's going to be corresponding to the negative 8. My x max is a positive 4. That's the largest that x can take on. The scale, it doesn't really matter. Your calculator doesn't really care. Um, but the scale is basically the increments on the x-axis. How, how do you want to count by? I usually just leave this at 1, but you can certainly change it to 2 if you want. Um, it doesn't really matter. The calculator really will use any scale that you tell it. Um, the scale will come into play a lot more if you're doing things like histograms. But when you're just graphing a function, the scale doesn't matter so much. We're told that the y values go from negative 5 to positive 5. So my y min is going to be negative 5, and my y max is going to be positive 5. And so now that I've entered my values, I'm not going to go to zoom this time because I don't want the calculator to automatically reset the window. Since I've um, manually typed in my window settings, I'm going to go right to graph. And that's what this function looks like. Now, hopefully you remember from Algebra 1 that functions must pass the vertical line test. So you'll see that 
there's this line, this vertical line here, um, which doesn't really make a lot of sense when we're dealing with functions because the function has to pass the vertical line test. With a rational function like this, this is a line that is called an asymptote. And an asymptote, let me type this, an asymptote is a line that the graph approaches but never touches or crosses. Mm, this will make a little bit more sense um, to you when you get to Algebra 2 because um, you'll deal a lot with functions that involve asymptotes. Um, but that's what the vertical line means. And so the next question, in, or question A, says to evaluate the function at negative 3. So if I wanted to do this, um, oops, if I wanted to do this using my um, table, now you are actually asked to fill in the table, um, and notice that there's no pattern to these x values. So I'm going to go back to my table settings. All of that bumping around that you hear in the background is my dog. She's chasing a fly because my windows are open, sorry. Um, I'm going to go ahead and set my window settings, my independent variable, back to ask so that when I go to my table, I can type in any values for x that I want. So negative 5, 1, 3, 15, you can type in any numbers you want, uh, 24, 36. And then I want to show you what happens when I actually type in a negative 3. There's an error message. And so let's go back to the graph for a second. Where does that vertical line appear? It appears at negative 3. And even though your calculator displays a line here, in reality, there is no line there. It's an imaginary line. So I should actually um, fix my definition for an asymptote. The asymptote is an imaginary line um, that the graph approaches but never touches or crosses. And often when we're graphing by hand, we indicate an asymptote with a dotted line. Um, so that it's clear that the graph is approaching the line, but it never touches or crosses. Your calculator doesn't have the ability to do that. Um, when your calculator graphs, it's a continuous graph, meaning that um, unless you enter in the function as several different functions, it's going to continue with, it's almost like one pencil stroke. It's not lifting the pencil. Um, and so that's why your graphing calculator shows this vertical line, even though it's not really there. It turns out that that negative 3 um, is where your function does not exist. And let's think about why that would be. If I look at my equation and I type in a negative 3, notice that I have y, or I'm sorry, that I have 1 divided by negative 3 plus 3. Well, we know that negative 3 plus 3 is 0. And look what happens if we go back to our home screen when I take 1 and divide it by 0. We get an error message. If I have $3 and I want to split it up zero ways, that means that I have to make that $3 disappear. And even though I'm quite capable of doing that, legitimately that cannot happen. You can't have a number and make it disappear. I could split it up 999,000 ways, but I would not be able to make it disappear entirely using mathematics. Um, and so we have this problem anytime we divide by zero. And as we um, get into some more complicated functions, you'll notice sometimes that we have to restrict our domain so that doesn't happen, so that our um, domain doesn't create an instance where the function doesn't exist. All right. Here's one more um, where uh, you're given an error message, and I just want to explain to you why. So let's go ahead and type this function into our calculator. And if you want to press pause, um, it's a good idea. You can actually um, complete the activity on your own, and then we'll talk about what that error message means. So go ahead and press pause. Okay. So um, what you should be seeing, I'm going to use the square root button, um, which is if you look where the x squared button is, the square root button is in yellow above that. So in order to enter that into my calculator, I have to hit the second button first, and then um, x squared. And so notice that the calculator automatically begins parentheses. I am taking the square root of the x plus 1 only. So if I type in x plus 1, I need to end the parentheses. And that lets my calculator know that I'm only taking the square root of x plus 1. Now I want to subtract 2, and that's going to go on the outside. Um, notice that you're given a command for zoom decimal. So if I go to my zoom 
and notice that's option four, zoom decimal. It's just a, a window that is a little bit smaller than your standard window. I think it goes from like negative five to positive five on the uh, x-axis and from negative three to positive three on the y-axis or something like that. Um, but it zooms in just a little bit more than your standard window. And this is what the graph looks like. This is a square root function. You're asked to complete the table of values. Notice that my x's are going in order, so in this case it's going to be easier for me to set my x-axis to start at negative 3. I'm going to set my increments at 1, and I'm going to click back to auto. So when I look at my table, notice there are a bunch of error messages. The question is why? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back to a zoom 6 window. And notice how this function does not appear on the left side of my graph. And that's because it can't. So if I tried to plug in a number that's less than negative 1, for example, and for example, negative 3, if we try to plug in negative 3, in fact, let's do that on our home screen. If I take the square root of negative 3 plus 1, well, think about it. Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. And if you try to take the square root of negative 2, you're going to get an error message because nothing squared is going to give you a negative answer. We get a non-real answer, and you'll learn in Algebra 2 what that actually means. But because the function doesn't exist um, to the left of negative 1, you're going to get error messages anytime you try to plug something in, and that's because you'd end up with an imaginary number, I'm giving you a hint into Algebra 2. So sometimes the error message is because you've done something wrong. Sometimes the error message is because the function doesn't exist. Um, at that place. So it's a good idea to make sure that you examine your error messages and understand what the different errors mean. Okay, the last thing I want to explore with you are the different ways that you can evaluate a function. So you're given, this is a polynomial equation, and you'll learn about polynomials in Algebra 2, um, but what I want to do is just show you some basic features of the calculator, for example, like how to calculate the minimum or the maximum the x-intercept or the y-intercept. I also want to show you how you can solve an equation using the graph. So if I type in this function, so it's going to be x, now since I'm raising it to the fourth power, I have to use my caret key, plus 3x to the third, minus 7x squared. Now at this point I can actually use my square button if I want. We've got minus 8x and then plus 12. You're given the window settings, so if I go to my window settings, I'm going to let my x min be negative 5, my x max be positive 5, my y min is negative 30, and my y max is 20. Okay, now once you enter your window settings in manually, you don't want to zoom, because um, it'll just erase those settings. We're just going to go to graph. Okay, and so you should see exactly what I see. So you're asked to determine the coordinates of each point. Well, point A is what we call a minimum. And in fact, in this function, it is the absolute minimum. It is the lowest point on the graph. Notice that we have a value here that is also considered a minimum, except this is what we call a relative minimum. Um, and that means relative to the other points around it, it's the lowest point. But it isn't the lowest point on the graph entirely. That's A. A would be an absolute minimum. Um, letter B corresponds to an x-intercept. Letter C corresponds to a maximum. But because this function actually increases um, it, on these ends forever, it's going to go towards infinity. Letter C isn't considered an absolute maximum. It's considered a relative, or sometimes we call it a local maximum, because relative to the points around it, it's the highest value. And then the D value corresponds to our y-intercept. So I'm going to show you some ways of calculating these values. So if I want to find the minimum, I'm going to go to my calc menu, and that's above trace. So if we go to second calc, you'll notice you have a lot of different options here. Letter A is a minimum, so I'm actually going to choose that option, option three. Now follow the prompts on your calculator. So notice where my cursor is. My cursor is way up here. I'm trying to find the point way down here at the minimum, and the calculator is asking me to enter in a left bound. So what I need to do is move my cursor, and I'm just going to keep using the left arrow until I get to the left side of my minimum. And as long as I'm on the left side, it doesn't matter how far I go, I'm going to go ahead and press enter. Mm -hmm. The next thing it asks for is a right bound. So now I'm going to move my cursor to the right of that point. And I know it's a little bit hard to see because the words are covering it. And for some strange reason, your calculator always asks you to guess. But well, we don't have to do that. If we press enter again, 
and it is a little bit harder to see that minimum point, um, the cursor anyway, um, but now you're given the coordinates. So I know the coordinates of my minimum have an x value of negative 3.15 and a y value of negative 27.57. So now I have the coordinates of my minimum. If I want to find B, B is an x-intercept. If we go back to our calc menu, notice there is no option for x-intercept. That's okay. Another word for x-intercept is the zero of the function. And we call it a zero of the function because it's where y is actually equal to zero. If I put in a zero there, that's going to produce the value of x that I want. Okay, so if I choose the zero option, notice again that the calculator is asking for a left bound, and it's also going to prompt me for a right bound. And that's because the, gra the graph crosses the x-axis several times. So if I don't kind of tell the calculator where to zoom in, then it's going to get confused. So if I want to find point B, I have to find a point on the left of it. So notice that my cursor is already to the left of it. I'm going to go ahead and press enter, and then it asks for a right bound, so I'm going to keep pressing my right arrow. And I know sometimes when the graph is steep, instead of looking like it's left and right, it looks above and below. Um, but just use your left and right arrows, and that's going to move me to the other side of that point. If I press enter, again, for some strange reason, it asks to guess. But there's the zero of my function. That's the x-intercept, negative 1.65. To find letter C, well, I'm going to do exactly what I did, except this time I'm going to choose the maximum. Choose option four. Again, we have to pick a point on the left. So I'm going to press enter and a point on the right. And press enter. Enter one more time, and that'll give me the maximum. Now, D is a little bit different. D now is my Y intercept. And so it doesn't have a special name. It doesn't have a name like zero to it. It's just the Y intercept. But the y-intercept of my function occurs when x is equal to 0. So another way that you can solve um, an equation or, or evaluate an equation for various values of x, we've already done it in the table. So an example, if I set my table to ask, I could actually type in 0, and it'll give me the corresponding value for y. Or on my graph, if I go back to the calc menu, where it asks for the value, that very first option, if I press enter, I can type in any value I want for x. So this is another alternative to using the table. So if I type in x equals 0, it'll give me my y-intercept. If I type in x equals 5, it'll give me the function evaluated at 5. So this would be an alternative to using the ask option on your table. You can actually just type in whatever values you want for x. Um, the downfall is all of those values have to be within the window screen. So I just typed in an 8 and I got an error message. And that's because my window only goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It looks like my the, the largest x value I can plug in is 5. So if I try to plug in an x value that's beyond my window, it'll give me an error message. The very last thing I want to show you, and I don't have a slide for it, is how to find the intersection between two graphs. So let's say I wanted to figure out um, what value of x will produce a y that is equal to 1. So if I wanted to figure out what x values produce a y value that's equal to 1, I'm going to go into my y equals screen, and I'm going to enter a second equation at 1. And if I go to my graph, I'm going to say, well, it's kind of hard. Maybe I'll make it 10. Oops. Let me make it 10 so we can see a little bit better. Okay, so if I wanted to figure out the x values that will yield a y value of 10, and we do this often when we're trying to solve equations, I can use the graph to do it. And I can see that my graph intersects 1, 2, 3, 4 times. If I want to find those corresponding x values, remember I already know the value of y is 10, I'm again going to go to my second calc menu, Oops. and this time I want to choose the intersect option. So that's option 5. So if I want to find this very first point, then what I have to do is use my arrows to move over there. Now this is where you can now use your up and down arrows, and that'll switch you from one function to the next. So it's actually going to be faster for me to go in a straight line than it will be for me to follow that whole curve. So if I wanted to find that first point of intersection, I'm going to move my cursor very close and then press enter. It's asking for the second curve. I'm going to press enter again, and then it asks to guess. But once I get that, I get my intersection. And notice that, you know, the intersections aren't whole numbers. That's okay. If I then wanted to find, like, this intersection way over here, I have to do the whole process all over again. So I do second, calc, intersect. And again, I need to now move my cursor all the way over. Now, if I follow my polynomial and all those twists and turns, it's going to take forever. So I'm going to use my up arrow to get back to that line. And then I'm just going to move my cursor 
all the way over oops, to that new point. Since there's four points of intersection, if I just pressed enter a bunch of times, my calculator would get confused. And so that's the intersection for the, for the other point. Um, it doesn't have to be a horizontal line. For example, my function could be, I don't know, 10x squared. When you get into algebra 2, you might be solving equations like this. Okay, so I've got my polynomial function that has all the twists and turns, and then x squared is just that single parabola or u-shape. And I can see on this menu or on this window that the functions intersect twice. I'm thinking that they probably intersect a couple more times, um, but we can't see them on this particular screen. If I wanted to figure out the intersection points, then I'd do the same thing I did before. Second, trace, and then option five is intersect. And just move your cursor over to the appropriate point. Press enter three times, and then you'll get the intersection point. So I hope this tutorial was helpful to help you understand some of the basic features of your graphing calculator. I hope that having a graphing calculator, at least on your computer, will help you with your homework and help you um, with the rest of your summer assignments. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Good luck.